Um, good morning and welcome to Pulse Exchange. Um, as you all know, um, the Labour Party leadership election is now reaching a uh, climax. Um, it's something we're very interested in Pulse Exchange to feature direction the leader of the Labour Party. Um, a couple of weeks ago we had the pleasure of having uh, Ed Miliband here. Um, and this morning it's brilliant to be able to welcome Dan Abbott. Yeah. Um, and Dan's going to be talking about something that we're also very interested in, the big society. Something that everyone is still feeling their way around. Obviously, a very uh, important issue: the future of civil society and how we get people to be more involved in politics. And the title of Diane's speech, uh, "Bob's Both Right: The Big Society, The Big Con," that tells us something about what she thinks about the issue. Um, uh, but uh, she's also going to be saying how her vision of how we do get a good civil society. So, thank you for coming, Dan, and over to you. Um, my fellow leadership candidates and I have been crisscrossing the country this summer on the leadership trail. From the Highlands of Scotland to the South Coast, from Wales to East Anglia, we've taken part in specially staged debates for the delectation <laughs> of party members. Uh, the media have written off this process as tedious in the extreme. The grander Guardian columnists have obviously met in the Liban Brothers, not to mention their father, at innumerable smart North London dinner parties. What use they argue a democratic process? Let the Toynbees and Aronoviches be the arbiters. And I have to admit, the process so far has not exactly been pop idle. But I would say that all party members who might not otherwise have seen this except on television screen have enjoyed it. It's given them an opportunity to comparison shop between the five of us. So they've packed into meetings in order to eye us up as a housewife might eye out packets of soap powder. And they have enjoyed the process hugely. But what the process has not done is allowed any of us to examine big ideas. The hustings necessarily because there are five of us and there are time constraints, largely consist of two minute replies to particular questions. But I think there are issues facing us as a Labour Party and issues facing us as a community that deserve more than a two minute reply. So I'm very grateful for the policy exchange to give me this opportunity to deliver this speech this morning. And the particular big idea that I want to talk about is one of the biggest ideas of recent times, David Cameron's Big Society. Now, as most of you know, he launched the idea just this July, hundreds of miles to the northeast of here in Liverpool. There is something about Tory politicians and Liverpool. Who can forget? Most of you have probably forgotten. Michael, the then Secretary of State for the Environment, Michael Heseltine, speeding to Liverpool after the riots there in 1981. He even dubbed himself Minister for Liverpool. He actually lived there for three weeks. Nor was he shy of state intervention. It was another era. His big idea was garden festivals, compost and potting plants. <laughs> there were apparently five garden festivals in Liverpool in all. But as the riots faded from memory, interest in the garden festivals waned also, and eventually they were heard of no more. But whilst fear of the urban mob was raging, Hesperty didn't mess around with any namby pamby big society. Instead, he strung all money out of his colleagues in government and big business with a simple statement about the citizens of the inner city. These people are burning this city, and if we let them, they will burn others too. So Cameron is not the first Tory politician to choose Liverpool as a place to emote about what you might call, what Victorians always call, the condition of the poor question. But whilst Hasseltine was a cheerful proponent of state intervention on a big scale, Cameron has a very different approach, which I want to examine this morning. In essence, he wants to restore and rebuild communities and social networks and he wants communities to take a hand in solving their own problems. No question of a dynamic minister flying to the rescue. It's that Cameron has described the big society about being a culture change where, and I quote, people don't always turn to officials, local authorities, or central government for answers to the problems they face. Cameron's big society is a package. 
is that he wants families, networks, neighbourhoods and communities that form the fabric of so much of our everyday lives to be much bigger and stronger. So, the government will give local authorities more powers, particularly over planning. Give community groups the, the power to take over local services, train community organisers, organise the National Citizen Service, encourage charitable giving, and it will all be funded by 400 million lying in dormant bank accounts. You have to assume that Cameron is personally, and possibly Steve Hilton, you have to assume that Cameron is personally very attached to the idea of the big society because it's been met with near universal derision. <laughs> and that's just from Tories. When Cameron first spoke about it, one anonymous Tory MP described it as, quote, complete crap, close quotes. The ineffable David Davis summed up the basic Tory position as follows, open quotes. The corollary of the big society is a small estate, but if you talk about the small estate, people think you're a till of a hum something David Davis is used to. If you talk about the big society, they think you are Mother Teresa. David Davis is further, further quoted by Financial Times as referring to the big society as being the Blairite dressing to a past agenda. Most journalists are not as ruthlessly cynical as most Tory MPs, so they've contended themselves with pointing out the big society appears to be an attempt to make a positive case for cutting government down to size and make it clear to people that even when the Tories have brought the deficit down, they will not be bringing back big government. So, is David Cameron's big society doomed to join Tony Blair's third way? Mm -hmm. Remember that? In the graveyard for serious pseudo philosophical ideas promoted by conniving politicians to mask their underlying policies. After all, I beg you to consider what happened in the third way. Prime Minister Tony Blair had President Bill Clinton as a co-conspirator in foisting the third way on an unwilling and comprehending public. They had grand international conferences and compliant academics. But the third way still became a joke. Will the big society go that way? Perhaps. But the question that I am asking this morning is that, is it really correct to deride the notion of strengthening families, social networks and communities just because the words come from Tory lips? And why should my party allow David Cameron and the Tory party to appropriate the notion of supporting mutual societies and cooperatives? These, after all, were bedrocks of working class self-organisation in the 19th century. The same working class self-organisation from which the Labour Party sprang, and they are very much part of Labour's heritage. I represent one of the poorest areas of the country, and all my life I have lived in and represented poor inner city areas. Unlike my leadership rivals, I don't make a flying visit to my constituency every weekend. I live there seven days a week. And Hackney has been the lucky recipient of every form of state intervention in the inner city since the days of Michael Heseltine. And that's taking about 20 years. I, but what I know from having lived there for 20 years and represented the people of Hackney for 20 years is that in truth and in fact, the government has been a great deal more successful in regenerating buildings in areas in Hackney than in regenerating people. I have never been successful because there are so many interlocking quangos and the money is hard to trace. Never been successful in actually adding up all the money, all the billions of pounds that have been poured into Hackney under governments of both political parties. But I've often remarked, maybe not publicly, but I'm remarking today, that actually in the past decades, had you stood on the corner for a few days and handed out bags of money to everyone who passed by, you might have had more immediate impact on the lives of ordinary people. You can't live and represent an area like Hackney after 20 years and not know that. Now, I don't want to sound ungrateful. The combination of a beneficent Labour mayor and a beneficent Labour government has made huge infrastructure improvements in Hackney in the past decade. We have a brand new underground line, the East London Line. We have vastly improved bus services. We now have Boris bikes. We have sparkling new stations. Millions have been spent on our hospitals. I have my son 
in the Hobbit Hospital 18 years ago is hugely improved, hugely improved because of labour investment. We have new buildings for our GP surgeries. We have five new secondary schools. Millions have been spent on primary schools and colleges. Millions have been spent on renovating our estates. And areas like Hackney as well in the inner city has, have been buoyed by the property bubble. When the West Indian community moved to Hackney in the 1960s, you couldn't give property away. But many a house pride, black house proud, black pensioner, whose door I knocked on in the last election, acquired their home in the 1960s at rock bottom prices, and many more have been able to sell those houses, originally acquired for tens of thousands, for hundreds of thousands at the height of the housing bubble, and head off to the Caribbean to leave, live lives of ease and luxury on their public sector pensions. So, the state has been able to improve infrastructure. It has presided in the, in the inner city at a stratospheric rise in property prices, which is both led to an improvement in renovation of housing stock and retail stock. And it has undoubtedly, the state, brought down unemployment in city areas all over the country. But fixing family structures and community relationships has proved more challenging. We know that something has happened to family structures and the cohesiveness of the family. When we see what we routinely see is family members crowding in front of television cameras to blame social workers when a child dies at the hand of another family member. The situation is always very tragic and one is reluctant to make any remark, but it is always noticeable how they never hesitate to blame social services but sometimes I wonder, what do they do? Don't they take any responsibility for that grandchild or niece? Have we society completely subcontracted out responsibility for family members to underpaid and overworked employees of the state? It has become too easy to lay on the state blame for issues within the family that are deep rooting, rooted and have evolved over the past couple of generations. To take an issue which I have a particular interest in, it is no wonder that working class boys of whatever colour continue to fail in schools when they grow up in a state where they rarely see a man getting up and going to work regularly, let alone a man sitting down and reading a book. My family laughs, started a room in one room with a cooker on the landing. Many friends of the family lived like that. But I have a gift beyond price, which I took for granted at the time. Every weekday that God sent, my father got up and went to work. And on Friday, he brought home his wage packet. It was a literal wage packet. This was, beyond, this was before you know, ordinary people routinely had bank accounts. So on Friday, he brought home his wage packet and doled up my mother's housekeeping and pocket money for my brother and I. And we also always got a bar of cabbage fruit and nut chocolate. <laughs> and what that seared all unknowingly into my consciousness and the consciousness of my brother was that this was what being a man was all about. Manly behaviour for us was going out and working to keep your family. It was that simple. Sadly, too few of the people on parts of the states that surround my house in Hackney have that simple notion of manliness. For decades, politicians and others have debated the problem of the single mother and female in households, both here and in the United States. But I believe that it is time now to have a little bit more debate about the men who leave and why it seems so easy for them to walk away from their responsibilities for family. And let me touch on, at this point, the sad history of the Child Support Agency. I was an MP when the Child Support Agency was brought in. And part of the intention, certainly in terms of the speeches by ministers of the Child Support Agency, was to make men, by the simple means of a financial sanction, sanction, to make men more aware of their responsibilities in family. And it's forgotten now, but the Child Support Agency went through Parliament without a vote. I was in the opposition party there. Both parties supported it. It, of course, became a disaster, a bureaucratic disaster. The more so because whilst 
the debate in Parliament about it was all about how you stopped working class men were walking away from their families. Actually, the way it was structured meant they flew completely under the radar as far as the transport agency was concerned. And once it started to impact on middle class men who, strange to relate, had walked away from their families, it became deeply unpopular. And people have, the government has walked back from the principle ever since. I take issues of family and community very seriously, precisely because I'm a child of immigrants. I grew up in an immigrant community where notions of interdependence and the importance of family were very real indeed. Because if you don't have strong community networks, if you don't have a strong family and a strong extended family as an immigrant, you simply don't survive. The pattern for West Indian immigrants and many other immigrant groups was always the same. Normally one family member would go ahead to Britain, they would go to a town or a part of a city where there was already somebody from their own parish. Well, I was recently in Derby, I was in Derby a couple of days ago, and they, they told me that the West Indian community there is all from two parishes in Jamaica. Because what happened is, year after year, people from the same area joined people from the same area. So they would, they would go to a town or city where someone from their own parish was, they would stay with someone from their extended family, they would rely on that extended family for helping getting a job, and all the sort of practical support that social workers attempt to supply today. Once they're established, they send for the rest of their family, off by one, often one by one, the mother and then the children, one by one. My father left school at 14, as was normal in rural Jamaica at the time, but he was always regarded as highly intelligent and something of a go-getter. That's where I get the bossiness from. And I can remember a steady stream of relatives coming to our house to live as their first home in this country when they emigrated to Britain. And I remember other relatives trooping to my father's door for advice about the puzzling new world of Britain and help reading and filling in forms. And those of you that know the inner city will know that in areas like Brixton and Hackney and parts of Birmingham, there are still a large number of West Indian pension pensioner who own their own homes. But do you know how they got the deposit? They got the deposit uh, by a system which is not known, I think, outside the West Indian community, where you get to government an informal savings club, and every week somebody, you put in a certain amount of money, and then in turn, you take it, you take the pot, as they call it, and people use that informal community saving network to get the cable of the deposit for their save, for their first home. Because community networks are so vital to immigrant groups, they tend to retain them long after the group as a whole has moved on and up the social ladder. The Jewish community is an example of a one-time immigrant group now firmly established in Britain's middle and professional class, which retains a robust community infrastructure and a sense of collective. I, and I say these things because we have got a custom, we've got a custom in the context of the leadership race to think about immigration as a problem and a challenge and a difficulty. But I think if we're trying to recreate a sense of family and extended family and extend communities and build um, social capital, we could do worse than look at the history of the working class in this country and the patterns that we see amongst immigrant groups. I should say that I reject the idea of broken Britain. I know of too many hard-working volunteers and too much unsung neighbourliness for that. Nor do I demonise young men in the inner city. I run a range of educational programmes, including an awards programme for London's top achieving black children. So I know, despite the odds, how many young people on our estates and in the inner cities continue to strive for academic excellence. If Cameron's big society it's just a way of marketing big cuts in the welfare state. It will be firmly rejected, not just by me, but by the British people. It will become deader than Tony Blair's late, unlamented third way. I also believe in strong, properly funded state institutions with paid professional staff. I do not, and I apologise to policy exchange here, <laughs> believe, I do not share the agenda of the Tory right for a smaller state. I believe that a proper social wage, a driver for employment, investing in housing are all preconditions for beginning to address the issues of family and community that I have touched on. But it is still the case that we on the left cannot afford 
to ignore or dismiss these issues yeah. or pretend that they are all solvable through money and investment. Money alone cannot cure all the ills of our inner city communities. If socialism means anything at all, it means that I am a brother's keeper. But these key issues of family and community have been largely ignored in the Labour leadership campaign. One of my contemporaries has set up, I think, a group of community organisers. But when you look at those community organisers, um, they don't really look like Britain. Now, there's a long history of middle class young men and women going into the inner city to help people. That's what the settlement movement in the East End was all about. But it's one thing to train relatively advantaged young people to go in and help people. It's another thing to revive and strengthen family networks, community networks, and social capital to get people to do it for themselves. In the end, the public, in a sense, is the head of politicians. They want their schools, they want their hospitals, they want the state to do the things they think the state should do in terms of protecting borders, in terms of law and order. But it is these issues of family and what is happening to community that trouble people more than anything else. When I knock on doors in Hackney, even if they're complaining about the baby of the kids next door or, or you know, the woman upstairs, what she's up to really, what they're speaking to is the breakdown of communities and the breakdown of extended families. So these are the issues that really matter to people. In the middle of an election campaign, where the press is already determined that anybody can win just as long as their name is Miliband. <laughs> and sadly, yesterday's politicians are reaching out from the grave to peddle their books and attempt to influence the outcome. Now we know, and I hope the government knows, that simple financial sanctions and so-called nudging does not necessarily alter human behaviour in the short run. But we do know that a mix of government action and a wide debate can alter human behaviour over a period of 10 or 20 years. It is a simple thing, but in my lifetime, I've seen attitudes to stroke uh, smoking transform. It's not just been about government action, it's also been about debate and discussion and moving the debate onwards. I am the lucky inheritor of a notion of family and community that I got from my own immigrant community. I live in the East End of London, which has a fantastic record of history of strong communities that acted for themselves. If we, as a Labour Party, invest in infrastructure and do not consider the lives and the families of the communities of the people that live in and around that infrastructure, we will have failed our communities. When I am leader of the Labour Party, I say when, not if. I will want to use the position to lead a debate on family and community. Not to say this is a, an alternative to investing in communities. Not to say this is an, an alternative to a strong state. But to say that this is something our people are yearning for. Perhaps Labour voters are yearning for more than any other voters. I, I regret this issue has been excluded from the leadership campaign debates. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share some preliminary thoughts with you all this morning. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dan. There's a, there's a lot to think on there. It's an extremely interesting speech. Um, we've got a little bit of time for questions and answers. <laughs> um, if you put your hands up, I'd um, be very happy if you identify who you are and where you're from. Um, I, I, just before we start, I thought I, I would uh, sneakily uh, take the first question, which is um, lots and lots of interesting things in speech. One of them that was very striking was the point about um, how unemployment, the lack of male employment in particular, undermines community and tends to mean it's apart. I mean, so that we now have a big debate about welfare reform in this country, we have what Ian Douglas Smith is doing, we have the things that James Pennell was trying to do before him. 
what's your what's your kind of take on that debate? You can't turn your face against welfare reform, but welfare reform that has the immediate short-term um, intention of cutting expenditure is not welfare reform that I would support. But you know, I've been here for 23 years, never been I do an advice session, and every so often I get someone who comes in and starts talking about their problem briefly, but then says, but you need to talk to my social worker. And I say to them, no, you talk to me. If you talk to me, you've come to see me, you talk to me. Why is, you know, why have I got to talk to your social worker? And I do believe very strongly, and it may be my own background makes me believe very strongly, in people taking responsibility for their own lives. They will be happier in the long run, it will be more an effective way of healing societies in the long run. I know that there are problematic aspects of the way the welfare state runs currently. For instance, I remember walking around the state of Kensington, the biggest state, it's called Wimbledon, up in Hackney, and when it was built by the biggest states um, in London, I know two things about this state. I've written, I've read books written about Wimbledon, and Wimbledon was built by the old London County Council, two thousand people from the East End, and they came to Wimbledon and they thought it was wonderful. You know, and they used to scrub their stairs, and they used to pick up rubbish and come in parts, and they looked after the estate. Um, and you wonder how we lost two or three generations on that sense of collective action. But the other thing about Ruby Dad, going around with Kevin Stone, he said, and I'm sure it's true, that there was a time that on council estates you'd have a mix of people. There was no great stigma about living with them. You'd have working people, you'd have the middle class and you'd have some of the people. What has happened, and it's the workings of the housing benefit system that caused this, is that estates increasingly, certainly in London, are full of people that do not work. And we have to find a way of breaking up that concentration of people do not because otherwise you get what I refer to. The situation of young boys growing up do not see, as my brother and I saw, men literally going out the door in the morning and going out to work. So I don't support welfare reform as a euphemism for cutting people's benefits. But I do support welfare reform if it can achieve two things. One, give people a sense of ownership and responsibility for their own fate. And B, stop our estates being just a collection of people who are all on benefits and see no hope and see no way out. Um, so, yes, uh, Martin Green, member of the Labour Party, personal capacity. Now, Diana, in line with your vision of the big rainbow society, would you advise your supporters to give their second preference to David Miliband? Well, after all, you're on the ballot. Over to you, Diana. Oh, well. Wow. <laughs> First of all, this, this is quite a sort of in house yes. uh, Labour thing. No, I'm not. I'm in this to win this. I'm not talking about the second preference. It's natural for David Miliband. Really, David Miliband nominated me, but so did Dennis Inner, and so did Jeremy Corbyn, and so did Corbyn. So. Yeah, Andy Strain, okay, consultant. Just um, some of your themes this morning have echoed some of the stuff that Dr. Smith was saying um, before he became minister. And I just wanted your views on how you felt the work of the Centre for Social Justice might help with some of the stuff you were saying. I, well, it remains to be seen as to whether in Duncan Smith's going to get stuck by George Osborne. Absolutely. Um, that's a broad political question. But, but I, think, I think I welcome anybody or any organisation that pays attention to what's happening in our own city, pays attention to it in a holistic way. I don't necessarily support the sort of remedies, all of the sorts of remedies, that the Centre for Social Policy Studies were talking about. But at the very least, they were focusing on an issue which I felt had been neglected for some time. Uh, uh, Julian Wilson from an investment company, uh, Mutuals, cooperatives, and their great tradition. How how far do you do you envisage an expansion of the movement could go and into what sort of areas? 
Well, I think that we could extend the mutual model into banking. And we've actually owned two banks now. I think the government just wants to sell that the private sector. But we could reconstitute them as mutual, more like building societies, with a mandate to invest in business. I think that the, um, the free market model of banking has been tested to destruction. And the building societies, I mean, it's really interesting. You, you can't go to a town in this country, and I've been to almost every town in this country in the past eight years, without seeing a local building society. Some of them have been brought up by big organisations. And the building society, that mutual model, at its best, was a representation of local pride, a representation of local aspiration. And literally, my brother being my brother's keeper, and that you, you know, to put your money into the mutual society to enable it to lend to someone else in the community to buy their own home. So I think the mutual model could extend into banking. I think the mutual model actually, and it's not my particular area of expertise, would extend into football clubs. It would be far better to have football clubs owned by a mutual well, cooperative than by random uh, for a millionaire's who some say are seeking to order their money. I think, I think it's a model that the public is ready to do this out. Well, the important thing with public services is to keep them whole and to have to retain core paid staff. And I think you probably find that people that work in the public sector would be very wary of going over to mutuals because they felt they would feel they didn't have the security. Hi, uh, Adrian Brown from the Institute for Government. Um, one, one aspect of Cameron's vision of the society, at any rate, is a much stronger sense of localism and putting power directly into, into people's hands, which at one level, anyway, implies a, a, a reduced step role for the big state for white or much more sort of local action and local decision making, which, so, which would lead to great variation of services and people deciding that they want to have a particular service here and happening in something else somewhere else. Is that an element of the society that, that you support, or do you still see that something like the NHS, the NHS system, should retain a, a strong central control? Well, actually, one thing I'm very keen on is empowering local authorities, because I think local authorities are often close to communities in Whitehall. And what we did in government was Tony Blair, as, as I think you can see from his um, interview last night, was not really a great lover of the Labour Party and his institutions. Right. And he didn't like local authorities because they were less big ones and mostly Labour. So he bypassed them, all sorts of quangos and whatever. So I'd like to see more important by local authorities and things like health. I'm, I'm interested in the idea of localism, but what you have to remember is I represent a very diverse community. It's a mosaic of a community. And what concerns me is that localism may work in a homogenous market town in Middle England. But in somewhere like Hackney, the danger is that if you devolve power to communities, what you do is you are in practice devolving power to just one community within the wider mosaic at the expense of other communities. And that community may have more social capital, be more articulate, and so on. So that is my concern about localism. I'm interested in the idea of localism if you can genuinely empower communities as a whole. Because, um, and it goes back to the question about cooperatives, I was actually in a cooperative in the 80s. I, I was a member of a cooperative, a left wing magazine, you won't be surprised to know, a cooperative um, uh, which ran a magazine called The Level. And you know what? Running a cooperative is an extremely time consuming thing. And, you know, I was a young woman in her 20s. Most normal people do not want to come over for days, but possibly children at home and then spend the hours that's needed to run a cooperative. So, locals is an interesting idea, but I'm wary within very, very communities of one strand getting the upper hand over others. And we must always, always remember there are people that really don't choose or don't wish to spend the amount of time it takes to run a local cooperative or mutual or whatever it is. Okay, um, across the line, yes. Dan, having listened to you, are you broadly breaking with the direction that the left has been trying to promote for the last 40 years? Because broadly speaking, the left in the last 40 years has emphasized the role of the state and has almost encouraged the citizen to rely on the state, both centrally and locally, almost away from the personal responsibility. And you know, put your faith in programs, spending, state, whatever. 
I'm hearing something quite different from you. I mean, is this a, a sort of gentle schism or, or not? <laughs> no, it, it's not as... Well, first of all, I think that I am drawing in a much earlier history of the left. The history of Ruskin, the history of the cooperative movement, the local mutual building societies. That, those were the sources. Those were the sources from which the modern Labour Party grew. I mean, trade unions are nothing if not collective organisations, certainly the early trade unions. So I think I'm drawing on the early history of the left in politics. I have to repeat, I'm in favour of a strong state. I'm not in favour of the big society if what it means is arbitrary cuts to welfare. But I, as, as I tried to indicate in my remarks, I come from an immigrant background, and by and large, Immigrants tend to believe quite strongly in self-reliance because it is the most self-reliant of a society that will leave their country and travel thousands of miles to another country and you survive when you get there through your self-reliance. So I believe in the state, I don't believe we live in a broken society, but I think we cannot allow the right, if you like, to have all the best students and I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that family and community, and yes, of course, the measure of self-reliance is important, but I'm not calling, you know, for what people on the right of the Tory party, perhaps the Tory party, will call for, is a contraction of the welfare state. But it's, it's about drawing people in to what you do as a government, drawing them in and genuinely empowering them. I've spent my life in politics, trying to be a voice of the voice of and I think maybe I've reached the point where I think, as well as being a voice for the voiceless, I want to, as part of the issue of my party, to genuinely try and empower people. I was interested in your remarks about the role of a man as a threatened. And it, it, one of the things that interested me about that was that surely if a right-wing man were to say something of that sort, then he would be one of the first things People suggest it's terribly sexist, as it was imposing a particular family structure. Uh, and I, I'm, it, it's surely one of the features of, um, of recent decades is that we've uh, tended to um, find it difficult to encourage certain kinds of role models because of the sense that we didn't want to contain uh, family structures into traditional forms. And I'm reminded of some of the debate around, uh, in the centre of so social justice work and so on, around the idea that um, certain kinds of traditional family structures actually were very much to the benefit of the disadvantaged. And that when we think of cohabitation and things of this sort, that actually they, they're um, middle class luxuries. Uh, and that when you start to say, look, it's fine if you cohabit and it's fine to have all kinds of um, uh, unusual family organisations, that that's all very well for people in very privileged positions. But when people uh, are in more difficult circumstances, actually quite structured ways of organising themselves tend to be much more to a benefit. And, uh, and I wonder whether that's some of the message that you're offering. I think what I'm saying is this, when I live in Hackney, and I know that families, effective working families, come in all shapes and sizes, and I don't believe that you can turn the clock back. But one of the things I've spent a lot of time on over the past 10 or 15 years, long before I had to make a decision about why I was going to send my son to school, was this issue about why boys fail. And the thing, you know, why boys fail in school, whatever they come, but particularly black boys. And it is, it is a fact that part of why I was there in school is that, for instance, primary education is a kind of time that was there. You can go from age 5 to 11 and then get an education. I think those are real issues. And although I know I'm a feminist, I'm a high fan feminist, I'm proud to be so, you know, you can't, you can't not look at those issues. And I do think that one of the problems young men in, the, in our own cities have is the sort of structures and the sort of framework which taught young men how to bear in a positive sense, not in the sense of being um, patriarchal or whatever, but taught them not being a man of the Of course, the thing about my father was, when he came to this country, he would actually go to work as a sheet metal worker, and he had apprentices. You know the thing about apprenticeships? Apprenticeships were the way that working class boys got to spend time with mature, um, responsible working class men and 
have a sense of what their responsibilities were to their workmates, to their family, to their community. And going along to a further education project is not the same thing at all. And I think some of the problems that we see in our own cities, particularly with the young men, have to do partly with decline of employment. Because my father got his set of blue walls from his job. He got his set of blue walls from his job. So you see the decline of blue collar employment. Um, um, employment. We've seen the decline of apprenticeships, real apprenticeships in absolute sense. And yes, young people can work on estates and their notion of manliness has been distorted to be about bling and your car and material things and not about manliness being about your responsibility to your family, to your extended family and to your community. So I'm not promoting a vision of manliness which would, I don't know, which, what? Uh, a sort of vision of manliness which is about patriarchy and power and very stereotypical male world. But, I, but just as Women understand that being a woman and a mother is actually about your relationship with your family and your relationship with your community. Men have lost sight, some of our men in our institutions have lost sight of the fact that being a man, being a citizen, if you know, is about your relationship and responsibility with your family. That's the point about I'm not standing up for stereotypical um, sort of male roles. I'm disappointed, but that's what I think. <laughs> There's a question about half um, Ian Orr, uh, uh, biodiplomacy, I used to work in the Foreign Office, but my question is really your idea of what are going to be, what you see as the social institutions that a greater sense of community could rely on. I mean, I, I should imagine all of us will have grown up uh, at a time when things like churches had much more influence within communities and, and much, you know, a focus for a, a lot of activity where people would meet uh, people with very different backgrounds, sometimes with shared events, fundraising and so on. Uh, but in, in a sort of age where, I mean, all of us, yeah, in a sense, are, are a very temporary community, but we're not a local community. We've all come from very different places. Uh, and there's, there's not a sort of sense of uh, continuity, but and the, the few examples that I can think of the local libraries who are reading books or you know, sometimes the fundraising, you know, fairs that will raise money or groups for you know, charities during the London Marathon and so on. But these, these are all very bitty. Uh, well, you know, the church is still a big deal in the city. I think more people go to church in Hackney on the average Sunday than go to any form of political meeting for the entire year. Um, and it's the church and religious institutions are still a very big deal in minority communities. So I think the church is one of the issues you have to work with, but in an even-handed way. Um, but, you know, you reach more, and we might do this. You know, some of these big churches in the city, they literally get thousands of people to serve them. And you reach more people working with and through those churches, as long as it's clear what the framework is, than you would almost any other way. I think that, I mean, in terms of reaching out to people, one of the things you have to do, and runs counter in a way to what I understand to be right on the agenda, is try and build stable communities. The problem in the city is the instability, which is caused actually by something that the right and the elements of their party are very keen on, labour market flexibility. <coughs> that's why I was wary of the end of the talking about people should be able to move from the state to the state, and the fact that council tenants will not have security of tenure. The key thing is stability of tenure. So you can walk around a community, as my parents walked around their village in Jamaica, and people know your mother, people know your grandmother, people know you. Where you have the kind of fist in Paris, um, endlessly mobile community life that we have, it's very difficult to influence people. I think stable communities are very important. It's, it's the instability of community life which has undermined family community. Once upon a time, people who grew up in an area expect to live close to their parents and go forward. Now, we all have to be in the No, 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 that's not. Uh, starting to come towards the end, we've got time for just a couple more questions. There's one here and one over there. Yeah. Charles, for example, and business executive. Um, 
I was very um, impressed by your description, both of the um, the way in which your father uh, looked after his family, the, the, the weekly wage, and also by the uh, the creation of self-help mutual building societies in the immigrant communities to help fund deposits, as they're misleadingly called. They are, in fact, equity investments. Um, but so my, my question was, given your adherence to the roots of the Labour Party, which came as well from the non-conformist religious movements, such as the one next door, the Methodist Hall, um, were these the product of, of invention, necessity being the mother of invention, and would they have grown in the same way as they did in an age of universal benefits if those had existed at that time? And the second question, which goes on from that, is since you believe that the big society, which I prefer another phrase for, since it's sort of a resonant, resonant of US Democrats, Lyndon Johnson, um, yeah, is a euphemism for benefit cuts. Could be. Could be. Is your fear that the big society agenda is a, a way of cutting benefits and recreating the necessity which will be the mother of invention? Well, we know what's happened to the, the West Indian traditions of extended family and such like that. We know how to guess. We know. Because the grandchildren of those people who came in the 50s live on the states of Hackney. And the northern the great people, but some have a very different approach to life. So we know what happens when we bring that sort of culture in touch um, with some of the national special of the welfare state. You know, you cannot, what we know is, as we, which we should have learned from the child support agency, you don't create benefits of social patterns by pulling the financial run out for one people. The politicians thought at the time that if you made guys actually pay for children, they'd be less likely to walk away from them. Actually, the child support agency has made no impact on family patterns whatsoever. So simple financial sanctions or simplistic action like that will not alter family community balance. I suppose that's my thing. First of all, I think it would be wrong to cut benefits. But actually, if you just slash benefits, people wouldn't say, oh, guess what? I have to discover what the plot is and stuff like that. No. They would go down and down and down. So what I'm calling for is a kind of comprehensive look at the issue. It is, of course, about state action, what the state does and how it chooses to do it. It's also about bringing in other actors, like the church and like the third sector. But it's also about the sort of debate that we choose to have. And I happen to think that the extent to which New Labour spoke about people as consumers rather than citizens was not helpful. Because yeah, yeah. what does a consumer do? If the consumer has the money, it can have everything it wants. There's no sense of there's any mutual obligation, that you can't have everything today or tomorrow. And I think the transformation that we've seen in the past 20 years from citizens to consumers has not been a helpful one for issues around family community. I really do feel that. And the 30 years of Labour government were complicit in that, although I think it started before that. So, no, I, don't, I think if you slash welfare benefits to our people not recreate culture traditions just like that. It's a much more complex process, but we have to lead the debate. And we, well, we have to have the debate, and we on the left should be at the front of that debate. I've not stood, um, stood in front of you and said, you know, I have 12 things that we can do tomorrow um, that will alter and reverse the, the way that a family's communities are fractured. What I am saying to you, partly because of the people I represent, I'm Gabriel, and then we might take two together in fact. I was very moved by what you said about kind of social solidarity uh, that came in in the community. But I'm wondering if there is a possible downside to that. I mean, taking the example of Pakistan and China quite well, you have actually quite a vulcanized society. You know, you have Black British in Dalston, you have Kurds and Spaniards working one's way up the Kingston Road. 
um, and one that has the old ultra orthodox in, in Stanford Hill. Um, what I'm curious about is whether you think that this kind of organization actually leads to a breakdown in, in, in social solidarity and social cohesion amongst communities. And is there a way to talk about that at the moment, to talk about that in the debate that's going on in immigration? Let's just, let's do that. Yeah, social, social solidarity. I, I, I deliberately spoke about social solidarity within immigrant communities because I worry about the debate which says that immigrant communities are just a problem. And I think we can learn from social solidarity. Actually, it's highly really happy. And it's not quite as organised as you say. I mean, if you know New York, I mean, the relationship between black people and their city in the United is infinitely better. Infinitely more better. The relationship between the rest of the community in Brooklyn. Um, and I mean, you can, for better or worse, interesting about Hackney is the extent to which particularly young people mix and meet and intermingle. We keep on a bus in Hackney and hear what appears to be sort of a sort of, you know, hat what we call it. And you turn around and the kids are white. Because what happens in Hackney is children go to school together. But I do take your point. I do take your point. What I'm saying though is this we need to recognize and value the traditions of social solidarity within American communities. We need to give them a value because they have a value. But what we have to try and do is weave them in to a 21st notion of social solidarity, which is broader and encompassing. Because if you insist that traditions of social solidarity in the middle communities are a problem, actually what happens is communities retreat <laughs> into almost asylum. So I think we have to acknowledge them, we have to value them, and we have to weave them together into a wider community of social solidarity. And if people feel that their traditions are respected, then we're willing to step forward. If they feel that their notion of social solidarity is disrespected, they're more likely to withdraw and decide their community. That's my view. And I think there's one in the last question, so I talk about it. So, yeah. yeah. Hi, Diane. I'm John Summers, a, a trainee social worker. Um, I wanted to pick up on, the, on what you were saying just a moment ago about um, uh, that this is important to have the debate around this, but that you weren't coming here with uh, a manifesto of 12 points uh, about exactly what you can do. I mean, what, one of the things that's very apparent about this debate is that it is around um, individual values and attitudes. And, and, you know, you've spoken a lot about um, the, way, the, the way people have um, values like thrift and solidarity and mutual support. Um, I know it's early days for you, you said you're only starting to think about it now and develop it, but, but, but what do you think uh, government could do at that level to influence individuals um, and help them develop those, those attitudes? Well, you talk, for example, about uh, building stable communities through housing policy. Yes, I think that what we've seen is that it's not as simple as people think government to change attitudes. And you don't do it in the short run. For instance, um, Gordon Brown had this great idea about um, uh, saving, what do they call them, savings to children? Uh, baby bonds. Baby bonds. And the idea was that every child was born with that savings account for them, and that would, um, that would build um, attitudes of thrift. But it didn't really work. It was the more sort of thrifty minded people that bothered, because lots of baby bonds went out and And there was more thrifty minded people that got out of their baby bonds and put money in and saved up. What would I do? I mean, I, I think, I, I think, I think stable communities are really important. People have to know each other and rub against each other, try to find them in a stable context to have any chance of having a sense of community. I think sometimes it's easy for social workers to just meet needs because the needs are so glaring, rather than work with people to encourage them to do things for themselves. Um, and I think social workers have a terrible job, actually. There's so much, as I say. What we, what we sort of do is we to unload our individual responsibilities of our family onto the social work profession. Mm -hmm. But for instance, people come to see me um, with their issues. And I'll often say to them, you go home, write a letter, and if you're not confident about the letter, come back and see me and we'll look at it and we'll help you with it. Not because it wouldn't be quicker for myself just to dash off a letter for them, 
But I think if you want to have a small way you can, you have to encourage people to realise that they are the arbiters of their own fate. Because I tell you, I'm a socialist, most of you probably this from or not, but what is always what is always motivating me in life is to say that I am the arbiter of my own fate. That's always motivated me. And I've never been afraid to call out racism whether when I see it, but I've never let racism define who I am or what I can do, what my children can do. And if there was one thing that I'd want for every child in my constituency is a sense that they are the arbiter of their fate. And I think there are ways that we can the things we can do about housing and employment to give people the skills to employ and house a child is very important. We went a long way as a government around level on flexibility. And all that leads us to unhappy and insecure people who blame the last of the group who's doing for their plight. It wasn't it wasn't the fault of black people who were barking that white people were barking couldn't get home to their children. But that's what they thought, and it provided a really bad for the BMP until we walk around. But it's also the way that some of the state institutions interact with people that can change. Let me just tell you a small thing. We've registered an education, registered an education for black boys. And what you find is that the black community for 25 years, and I'm talking about black business, community around the so I apologise. We've had a tradition of Saturday schools, completely voluntary schools, run by parents and teachers that are on a Saturday to try and make up whatever ground they think their children are losing in the week. And many of them go back to 25 years. Now the interesting thing about the Saturday schools, the same boys that go to school Monday and Friday with the you put them in the Saturday school where their mum is helping to raise the money and their mum pops in to cook the lunch and the teacher knows their mum. And they are differently behaved children. And it's something I brought up with ministers and failed to get them to engage with properly. But the reason that the Saturday school movement has achieved results with black children, particularly boys, which you don't get in mainstream schools, is the level of parental involvement. But the thing about parental involvement, you can see that happening. It can't just, what you, the, the challenge is how you involve the communities that have less social capital, less confidence, and so on. But I think that maybe organising things in a different way, trying to involve people, giving a sense of ownership. But it's, none of these things are quick fixes, but you have to understand where you're going. I'm afraid that the bell sang we are we are out of time. And I've always thought of you as a, as a very interesting person to listen to. You've not disappointed us today as usual yeah, yeah, yeah. and learned a lot from that. Lots of food for thought for all of us. Um, only really remains to, to thank you in the conventional way. Thanks.